we've been looking these last few weeks on the subject of hell and uh, how it is revealed in Scripture and the reality that we face in uh, regards to eternity. And I do know that there are many things that are frightening when you think about eternity, when you think about especially an eternity apart from God, apart from His presence. Uh, there is, uh, you know, of course, many things that people think of with Satan or demons. They make scary movies about these subjects. And, uh, you know, Hollywood does to the best of their ability to portray these things. And uh, I do submit to you that the supernatural is very real. Um, that I've seen things and, and experienced things uh, in the demonic realm. I've seen people attacked. I've seen people possessed. Uh, I wish that I was just crazy. You feel crazy sometimes experiencing those things. I wish that's what it is, but the, the, the kingdom of darkness is very real. Hell is a, is a literal thing. It is a place. The devil is real. Uh, th there are people who, when, if they so choose, will spend eternity there. It breaks my heart. I wish that was not true. I wish this was a myth or a, a, a bedtime story, but it's very much reality. But I think the most, uh, to me, perhaps the most frightening thing, the most disturbing thing about hell is what we're going to discuss today, and that's the fact that hell is growing. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not a, a static place. It, it doesn't just stay uh, the size it is. Scripture talks about it, and that's important to understand because I, I believe that sometimes we uh, have neglected to uh, have proper respect for eternal things, proper respect for spiritual things. We, we get so set in our ways and so comfortable in our everyday life, we ignore these things. And, and in the church world, it's, it's a whole lot easier, you know, just to talk about other stuff and sometimes shy away from these harsh realities. But hell is real, and the reality is uh, that hell is growing. In, in Romans 3.23, and in Romans 6.23, if you've got your scriptures and, and can look with me, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, it's two very familiar passages of scripture. I just want to talk about them uh, to begin this morning and, and look at this subject of hell and how it is growing and how that should concern us and cause us to respond. And I want to ask you if you would to stand with me while we read God's word, First Romans 3.23. It tells us very clearly that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know this to be true. So if, if you're human, you are regarded in that reality that all have sinned. Uh, there is none good but one, Jesus said. And uh, that's a, a truth we need to recognize. And then in Romans 6.23 kind of furthers this, really all the chapter of Romans 6. I, I encourage you to read it this week. But the 23rd verse reminds us that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Could I ask you to pray with me for the word today? And let's just ask God to have his will this morning. Father, thank you for the word that you've given us to be our instruction, to be a light and to our path. God, I don't believe there's going to be any that accidentally end up in hell. I believe they're, they're going to have had to make choices. Your, your mercy is too good for that. But God, let us, let us be aware of the deceit of the enemy, of, of the way that he tries to distract us from the, the, the way our life is headed. And Lord, we want our life to be directed just completely towards you, towards eternity with you. And we want to be living a life that reflects that. Speak to us this morning, I pray. Change us in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. And uh, These two scriptures have been repeated many times that we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's, that's key here. Our, our measuring stick, y'all remember at, uh, you know, if you ever went to like Six Flags or Amusement Park, there's those little things that say you must be this tall to ride, so you know you, you've got to reach a certain height to get on uh, certain rides. I know uh, a dear Corky BB may never get to ride a roller coaster in her life. Uh, she's not in here, is she? Okay. Oh shoot! Uh, I thought you were in the nursery today. 
Well, but it's it's just it's a fact of life uh, that there's certain things you have to reach certain uh, heights to be able to do. And spiritually speaking, it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The the threshold, the measuring stick for heaven is God's glory. We must be righteous as He is righteous. And it says no sin can stand in the presence of God. He he literally destroys sin, and so. Uh, we know that this is a very high measure we have to reach. And in Romans 6, 23, then we see the reality that the wages of sin is death. And this is uh, alluding to it, speaking of the second death, eternal death in hell, uh, which Jesus spoke about and, and the prophets declared about and and the apostles went into the world to warn people about it says but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord and we're going to come back to this verse later but the first point I want you to realize is the first half of that verse the wages of sin is death the reality is sin has a cost there's a price to pay for sin now I, I was talking earlier you know about the uh, gym we were wanting to how we want to repurpose it this life center we're wanting to do to allow people to have a place to become more physically healthy. But how many of you know that your spiritual health is of utmost concern? It is a real thing that you have a spirit person. There, There is a part of you that is eternal, that when you are born, there's a part of you that will never die, and it will either live on forever in heaven or in hell. And if you are spiritually sick, if you have sin in your in your heart, if you have sin in your life, you sin against God, it causes you to become spiritually sick. And now, even as followers of Jesus, even as Christians, we can be misled, we can be uh, deceived, and we can make a choice to sin. And while that might not be able to strip away our salvation, just you know, a certain sin or this, that, or the other, it can still make us physically and, and spiritually sick. It can wound us. Sin always has a cost. And I, want you, I, I should probably also say that every sin, has a cost. Can I tell you, sin is the sa- sin is sin in God's eyes. It says that even liars will have their place in the lake of fire. So, you know, we like to think, well, I haven't committed murder, or I haven't, you know, done this, that, or this, these bad, bad, bad sins. Can I tell you, sin is sin to God, and every sin has a cost. The reason I want to say this over and over is I don't think very many people in our culture really respect this. They don't really believe it. They think, well, Only sins that other people find out about have a cost. We think that sometimes. We think, well, they don't know what I'm doing in my, you know, personal life. They don't know what's going on when I'm by myself or when I'm not around church people. And we think only sin that gets caught by people has a cost. The reality is spiritually every sin, every single sin. And I don't say this to scare us as much to make us aware of the reality we face Sin does have a cost. It separates us from God. God is our creator. He is the giver of life. He's the one who we want to be. If you want to have eternal life, you have to be with God. You do understand that, correct? That that, that God is who we have life. It says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we choose to sin, you may not have thought of it in this extreme of realities, but when we choose to sin, we are choosing death. And I know there's nobody, I was just talking to a brother this morning, you know, when people get consumed by, by addictions or things, no one starts uh, drinking or doing drugs recreationally, whatever it might be, that becomes a vice for them. They don't do that thinking, I want to become an alcoholic, I want to become a drug addict, I want to beat my family, or I, I want to ruin my health. You know, uh, I've, I've lost dear family to drugs and, and overdose and, and just the the pain that goes along with that and none of them set out saying this is what I want the end game to be but sin always has a cost and when we choose to sin we're choosing death you may think well I'm just going to tell this lie they're not even going to know who does it harm you when we begin to tell one lie and kind of get away with it that sin, it festers. That, that really brings me to the next point. Sin not only has a cost, sin is also a cancer. And, and I say this because I think this is a term a lot of us are familiar with. It's not literally, I don't want you to hear me saying that people have cancer because they've sinned. That's not what I'm trying to say. 
I wanted to make a, a metaphor here that we would understand because I, I dare say all of us probably, if not all of us, almost all of us, either know someone or have been affected by the terrible disease of cancer. It's a horrific thing. It's a really scary thing to hear yourself or someone you love be told you have this disease, you have cancer. Even today with all of our advancements in medicine and research, it's a frightening thing. We just had someone in our family that, that was diagnosed with, with cancer, and it, it was uh, you know a, a very somber thing. Someone I love dearly and, and who's, who's very young and has kids, and it just you're just thinking, this is such a horrible thing to hear. And I, I wish we really viewed sin the way it really was because maybe we'd be more quick to, to keep it away from us because sin is, it not only has a cost, it is cancerous, and like a cancer, it does not want to stay contained. People think they can control sin. You cannot control sin any more than you can control cancer. You know, we treat it, we, we fight it, we do the best we can, but, but ultimately, you know, we're, we're kind of at its mercy. We've got to try to stay away from it, stay away from things that would feed it. You know, there's certain types of cancer that, you know, estrogen feeds. If you've studied it, if you've known someone that maybe had breast cancer or had something of that nature that are estrogen-fed, and, and that's in all of our sugars that we eat. You know, everything has refined sugar. And my sister fought and, and, and is continuing to do a great job of overcoming breast cancer, but she's very careful with what she allows in her body because she knows that can feed that cancer physically. Can I tell sin works a lot in the same way? We think we've got it under control, but can I tell you, it never wants to stay in remission. It never wants to stay contained. It spreads and it destroys. Amen? Sin spreads and destroys. And so so many people are playing with it. So many people are, are allowing it in their mind and in their bodies. And it doesn't always come in the form we would think it would. Uh, you know, uh, this, this, like I said with my sister's situation, I like refined sugar. Amen? It's in basically all that is good. Uh, you know, uh, I, I've, I've learned, you know, that to be healthy, you pretty well need to eat dirt and tree bark. Is, is what it seems like at times. I'm just kidding. It, but can I say that does prove a point. We've trained ourselves to think that what's not good for us is good physically. Uh, it, 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 children, it's so amazing. We've been very careful. We've tried to be anyway with our kids to have them eat healthier than we did at their age. Not just pump them full of Oreos, you know, and and, and things of that nature. Not that that's evil. You know, I mean, kids like their Oreos, whatever. But it's fascinating to me. My kids crave, they like healthy stuff. It's weird. Stuff I don't like, they like. Can I tell you, it's because they are not taking that refined sugar in their bodies constantly. And I tell you, the same thing works in the spiritual realm with sin. Sin is cancerous in that way. When we keep taking it in, when we keep doing things that are against God, that are rebellious to, to God, it may not be things you, you would think. Sugar doesn't seem that bad until it feeds something in you that's killing you. And I'd say the, the ultimate sin really is, is one that, you know, it's not lying or murdering or, or stealing or any of that really. The sin that got the devil kicked out of heaven was simply pride. That was the one he said, I will be like God. I will exalt myself above God. That's what we're saying. When we choose death, we're also saying, I know better than you do, God. When we choose to sin, we're saying, I've got this all figured out. I'll be fine if I make this decision, and I will make a decision that goes directly against what you've told me to do. Then we get mad at God. Because our life is falling apart. We get mad at God. Why is this happening to me? Why are you doing this to me, God, when we've done it to ourselves? Sin is a cancer. It's not to be played with. It's not to be trifled with in that way. And it spreads. It destroys. Isaiah 5, one of the most interesting passages about eternity, about hell. Isaiah 5, verses 14 through 16 says, Therefore death, and notice it's capitalized in this translation, therefore death, King James Version actually says hell. That's what this represents. Therefore, hell expands its jaws. Remember, the wages of sin is death. It will send you to hell. Death expands its jaws, opening wide its mouth. Into it will descend their nobles and masses with their brawlers and revelers. It doesn't matter who you are, noble, whatever. If you're, if you're someone who's fighting against God, it will swallow you up. 
Verse 15 says, So people will be brought low, and everyone humbled, the eyes of the arrogant humbled. But the Lord Almighty will be exalted by His justice, and the Holy God will be proved holy by His righteous acts. You say, why, why does God send people to hell? He's such a mean God. He's so, why would a loving God ever let someone spend eternity in hell? Can I tell you, if God did not punish sin, He would not be much of a righteous king. If God let these horrendous things go unpunished, why would we follow Him? If you went to get cancer treatment and they told you, well, this treatment isn't really going to get rid of cancer, I wouldn't want to use that treatment. Amen? I, I would want to remove that completely that's trying to harm me. Uh, if they said, well, this can get 50% of the cancer, this can get whatever percent of the cancer, I want the one that's going to wipe it out of my body completely. I, I don't want it in me at all. So when God shows his righteousness, as it said there, the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice. The holy God will be proved holy by his righteous acts. It's showing God is who he says he is, and he will not tolerate sin of any kind of in, because he knows the harm it causes. It's not because he doesn't want us to have fun. It's because he wants us to have real joy, stuff that we can do and not have to feel guilty about or feel that gross remorse because of what we've done that we know is wrong. And I tell you, Jesus said he's come that we may have life and have it to the fullest, more abundantly. That's what life in Christ really is. And so this sin that has a cost, why would we pay that price? Jesus paid dearly so we wouldn't have to live in sin. It was so important to him that he died for us, that we could be free from our sins. And why would we allow that cancer to be in our bodies? Why would we allow that spiritual disease to wreak havoc in us? And that's what I say, like, I know that when you, when you get saved, you're not just instantly perfect, but can I tell you, he that is perfect is now your Lord and Savior. When, when you have the Holy Spirit leading your life, the Holy Spirit won't be lead, He's not called the hell spirit. He's not leading you towards things that would lead you to hell. He would be leading you towards God. You need to learn to listen to Him. You need to learn to walk in the Spirit and in truth that God calls us to worship Him by. And so the, the final thing that I want us to, to understand is, yes, yeah, sin has a cost. Yeah, it's cancerous. But ultimately it has a cure. And we should recognize that and, and run to that. If you had cancer in your body, if you have had or do have, my, my heart goes out to you. My, my mom is a two-time cancer survivor. Like I said, my sister has battled it. I lost an aunt to it. I've lost a lot of dear people to me, to that horrible disease, the, the way it affected them physically. And if someone you know has a cure to it, we would run to it. We'd say, I'll, I'll take that pill. I'll drink that serum. Whatever you got, I'll do it. It should be the same with the spiritual disease that's more destructive. We should be saying, give me that. Give me two doses, whatever I need to remove. Sin does have a cure. And see, many people, the problem is they don't think they need a cure. They don't think they have a problem. And there's so many that think, well, I would never follow Satan. I don't want to go to hell. I would never do it. But can I tell you, you're following his example if you're rebelling against God. That's exactly what the devil did. When we start making our own rules to this thing called following Jesus, well, I don't, th that's not my problem. You know, I, I don't have to follow that law, or I don't have to follow that command, or that, this, that, or the other. Look, we're not bound by the law. We're free by it, but we should be following God's voice, not our own. Don't follow your own thoughts. They'll get you in trouble, and they'll lead you down a path of destruction. The cure, we've already read it in Romans six twenty three. I want to look at that scripture again kind of in closing the wages of sin the cost of sin is death but the gift recognize that first God is giving this to us you got to pay a lot of money for medicine can I get an amen on that our healthcare industry is a mess people are profiting over off of other people's weakness in, in their times of need the pharmaceutical industry should be ashamed of themselves and, and I tell you that's one reason my heart is so full to see people healed by God because, one, it's miraculous. Two, it doesn't cost them anything. Jesus already paid the price for that. We should, be, we should be walking in that. We should be wanting that, desiring that. Can I tell you, that's in here. Just like salvation, it says we have healing by his stripes. We are healed. We need to walk in that and live that. But we're not going to be doing that if we're, if we're busy, you know, not believing God, if we're sinning against Him. 
And like I said, many think, you know, if Satan was here leading us, you wouldn't walk after him, but you are following his example, and you may not realize it by rebelling against the Lord. The answer to this is the last part, this gift that God has given us in Romans 3.23. The gift of God is eternal life. And now different translations say this next word many different ways. Some say is eternal life with Christ Jesus. Some say through Christ Jesus. The most accurate to, to the way we speak English today. Because all are, are correct. I'm not trying to confuse you. It's just, you know, times have changed. We say things differently now than we used to. The words have different meaning. The way that makes the most sense in, in the 21st century is we have life in, and I capitalize it because I want you to know, notice that word. We have eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because, see, there's too many people, and, and just hang with me here because I'm about to close. Do not miss this point, though. There's so many people that are living, they're trying to live for Christ. But that's different than living in in Christ. You will exhaust yourself trying to live for Christ because you'll never do enough good deeds. You'll never, you'll never be able to prove yourself worthy of Jesus. He's Jesus. I mean, you're not going to live up to that. But living in Christ, understanding he paid all the price anyway because you got to be careful. We'll fall victim to that, that horrible sin of pride. We, we live for Christ and we want to say, look at what I have done. Look at the things I've done for God, the things I've done for Jesus, the things I've done for that. But when you live in Christ, you realize it's not I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And then that power unlocks in you. See, that destroys some things. That destroys where we can worry, where you can have doubt. That doubt about, I'm never going to be able to do right because I've never been able to do right. Okay, I get it. You can't do that, but Christ who lives in you can. You have to trust that God has given me everything I need and then some. God has instilled a power. You're like a nuclear reactor on steroids with the power of God. Do not doubt that you can be who God says you can be. Quit going back to your old ways. Quit trying to live for Christ and just live in Him. Many people don't spend enough time just getting to know who God is. They, they don't live in Christ. Jesus didn't walk around worrying about what other people thought. He communed constantly with his heavenly Father. He heard from God directly. Can I tell you, you don't have to hear from a dude with a microphone. You can hear from God of heaven. Speak into your heart. Direct your steps. It doesn't just happen on Sundays or on Wednesdays. You can walk into your place of employment. You can walk into your home and hear God's voice speaking to you. And I tell you, the devil cringes at that thought. He's terrified of you, of who you are when you release Christ in you. Because he can't stand up against it. The gates of hell can't prevail against it. So yes, hell has been growing, but only because we've allowed it. Only like that cancer in our body. If you ignore it, it'll continue to grow. But we can push back the gates of hell and say, Hell's going to grow the opposite direction. We're going to shove it back where it needs to be in the pits of eternity designed for the devil and his angels. It was never designed for me anyway. I'm not going there, and I'm not going to let anybody else go there. Amen. We're going to declare Jesus to be stronger and better. He's the way out. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Everyone comes to the Father by him. No one comes except by him. It's only by Jesus. He is the cure. Would you stand with me, church? And if somebody will come to the... The music quickly, please. I want us to pray. And if you would, bow your hearts just so you're focused on just yourself and the Lord. And anyone under the sound of my voice that you've been allowing sin to run rampant, things are going through your mind, your conscience. That, that's the Holy Spirit. He, he's, he's speaking to your conscience, and you're like, I need to get rid of these things. I want these things away from me. I don't want this cancerous behavior or attitude or belief in my heart, in my life. I want to destroy it. I want to see God just wipe it out of me. The gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life. Okay, you got to understand, life eternal happens when you're born again. When you, when you follow God, you begin your eternal life right now. We always think it's like after we die. Yeah, well, that too. You're, you're never going to die. You're going to be eternal. It happens the moment you become alive in Jesus Christ. And so you can walk in victory in Jesus. You, you need to learn what that means to have life in Jesus, not just for him, but in him. 
that, that in Him you have life and in Him you live and move and have your being. I mean, that, that's what that's all about. Your decisions are not about your own selfish desires or about what, what am I doing to live for Jesus this way. Your, your, your thoughts are no longer about your limitations. It destroys worry and destroys anxiety. That's that peace that passes understanding. That's when you realize God's in control of my life. Who can, who can be against me if God is for me? What disease can do anything to me if, if God is for me? What can anybody do? You can take my job away. You can take my house away. You can burn everything I own down. You can beat me physically. You can throw me in jail. It doesn't matter. I am who I am because God says I am. And Jesus is in me. Jesus is living through me. And all that is, is what we receive when we receive this gift of God through eternal life. And if you're in here and you've been playing with sin, I tell you, it's bad. It, it, it'll mess you up. You've been doing things, and maybe, maybe silently, maybe privately, and other people don't know about it. And you want God to burn that out of you. You want to give that to God and, and live fully, live life to the full, like Scripture says. If that's you, would you raise your hand high in this place? Say, I want to be free. I want to be free all over this place. Praise God. Raise your hands high for just a second. Keep, keep them up there for a second. I want to pray for you. And will you just lift your other hand and ask God, God, set me free. Give me that. It's a gift. It's not because of anything you've done to deserve it. My goodness, church, will you look around? Will you pray for these people with their hands raised? Just reach your hand towards them. Father Jesus, we, we, we just cry out to you, Lord. You are, you are so good. And we know we're nothing without you. But man, with you, God, we have power. We have authority. And, and God, we speak that we're not who we used to be. We're not who we were five seconds ago. We receive right now your salvation. We receive your transformation, your sanctification. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray you would empower these people. You would fill them with your spirit. They would hear your voice. And they would be free of those things. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. So they don't have to go back to their old ways. They don't have to go back to that old doubt. So, so, some, of, some, some of you, hold on, put, put your hands down for just a second. Some of you, I, I want to tell you, you've already received all you need from God. If you've asked Him, you by faith receive it. Okay, that's it. Some of you, before your foot hits the parking lot, before you even get out of this building, the devil is going to try to put that in your mind that nothing has changed. You're just going through the motions and you're going to do this again next week or whatever. Sin has a cure and it's Jesus. Doubt has a cure and it's Jesus. Everything you just got from God, hold on to it. When the devil begins to, begins to say those things, when you get back into real life today, tomorrow, at, the, at your work, wherever it is, and that temptation comes against you, I want you to declare something for me, for the Lord, really. I want you to agree with me to do this. Will you, in those moments you feel your weakest, where the enemy's attacking you, because he wants you to go back to who you were. He wants you to go do what you used to do and give up on who you are. When that happens, I want you to declare some scripture that says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Will you say that with me? I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Notice that word in again. It's not because of you. So quit thinking, well, I failed yesterday. It doesn't matter. Jesus is walking with you today. He is in you. He is living through you. Amen. And he does not fail. Even death couldn't bring him down. Amen. Praise God. Church, I, I want to pray us out. And I want us to go with the Lord. And I tell you, we need to push those gates of hell back. I, I, I pray that God would, would speak to your heart. Get to know God so you can know what you can do for God. Some of you, He wants you to pray for your family. He wants you to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. He wants you to change the way you live your life so other people will see Jesus through you. He wants everybody to be doing that, not just one or two of us, okay? So let's walk in this power. Let's walk in this blessed gift we've been given by God, the gift of God that's eternal life. Let's start living that life right now, that gift of love that we can share with the world. Can we pray that before we're dismissed? Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare that we are changed by you. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. We're new creatures. We are one with you. And Christ lives in us. We're not just living for you. We're living in you. And so, Father, that same power that got Jesus out of that grave, it's in my body, it's in my spirit. That same power that gave him the boldness to stare down death 
and say, God is stronger than you. Give me that kind of power to stare down temptation, to look at those imps and demons that are going to come around and try to attack our family and say, no, you get out of here in Jesus' name. You be away from my mind. You be away from my family. You be out of our community. This world has been sick for far too long with this disease of sin, and we declare healing and health. No more sexual perversion. No more hate and greed and bigotry run rampant. We will be the light that destroys the darkness in the name of Jesus, by the power of Jesus in us. And all that will agree that way said, amen, amen. Will somebody give God glory in this place for who He is? Hallelujah. And who His Word says we are. Praise God. Church, you're dismissed. Go with God today. We got that membership class for those hanging around. Now let's go live this, amen. Don't just shout about it. Let's go show it to the world. Go with God. God bless you.